The second debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden is off after the president declared this morning he wouldn't participate in the new, new virtual format the Commission on Presidential Debates wanted to switch to for, quote, the health and safety of all involved. I'm not going to waste my time on a virtual debate. That's not what debating is all about. They're trying to protect Biden. Everybody is. He's actually right about that. They are trying to protect Biden and everyone else involved in the debate from the COVID outbreak spreading through the White House. The president likely would not still be infectious by the Wednesday night, which is around 12 days since he first experienced symptoms. But the virus has been spreading among his staffers as well. And since Trump got back from the hospital, he hasn't exactly been adhering to safety guidelines or encouraging anyone else to either. Instead, he's repeatedly told the American people they'll be fine even if they do catch the virus, even though it's killed more than 200,000 Americans, almost none of whom got the care the president got. You're going to get better. You're going to get better fast, just like I did. I think this was a blessing from God that I caught it. This was a blessing in disguise. Trump also called the experimental antibody cocktail he was given a cure, even though there is no cure for COVID, only treatments. He also said it should be available to everyone for free, even though it's still being tested and doesn't have FDA approval. But while the past few days have been focused on the White House COVID outbreak, we are far from immune here in Massachusetts. In fact, the number of red zone or high risk cities and towns in the state nearly doubled in the past week. We're now up to 40. That includes Boston, where Mayor Marty Walsh announced yesterday he's pausing any further reopening of schools, although the highest need students who already started some in-person learning will continue. In response, the Boston Teachers Union is filing for an injunction to keep teachers from having to go into school buildings in person. As that battle plays out, our state and local officials and even individuals doing enough to get things under control. I'm joined by Dr. Sandy Nelson, an infectious disease physician at Mass General Hospital and assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, who's been helping guide the Baker administration on reopening schools, and Sam Scarpino, an assistant professor of network science at Northeastern and the head of the university's emergent epidemics lab. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Let me start with my big question. We spent a lot of time earlier this year talking about getting ready for the surge with a capital S. The surge arrived, we got through it. Are we now at the beginning of a second COVID surge in the state? Well, I think from my perspective, there are a number of indicators that are pointing in the wrong direction, suggesting that we may be headed towards uh, another increase in cases. We're seeing hospitalizations up, we're seeing the percent positive up. And so while it doesn't seem that we're in a surge right now, we are certainly heading uh, very much in the wrong direction. Sandy, what do you think? You know, I would agree with that. I think the numbers are definitely moving in the wrong direction. Um, but I think we also have to qualify a little bit what we mean by, the sur by a surge. And in the spring, I think it was really more like a tsunami. It was this huge wave that really just hit us and, and we, we were caught unprepared. And I think now we're finding that the waters are a little bit rockier, um, but we're a little bit better able to equip. We're a little bit better equipped in terms of handling that. Can you elaborate a bit on the ways in which we are better positioned now compared to six months ago? Well, certainly, you know, speaking from the perspective of the healthcare system, we learned a lot from the first wave. Um, we have a better, we have a much better testing capacity. We have a, a much better um, infrastructure for contact tracing, which is really important in the community settings. We've really built up and stockpiled our personal protective equipment, so we're ready. We're not worried about shortages, at least I should say for my hospital. Um, and I think we've really thought through how to position patients such that we don't have to shut down care in other parts of the hospital, so we can continue to provide the that we need. All of those were lacking, um, or at least deficient in the first wave. Uh, Sam, let me ask you, uh, since you are uh, the director of the Emergent Epidemic Center at, at Northeastern, are there steps we should be taking on a macro level, public health steps that could be implemented society-wide or in big portions of society to keep a lid on the spread of COVID that we are failing to take at this point in time? Well, I certainly agree that we're in a much better position now than we were in the spring. We were caught unaware. We didn't have the right personal protective equipment resources for the healthcare workers or essential workers. We didn't have testing in place. And so all of those things have certainly improved. However, I do think that there are a number of areas where we can be doing much better. I think understanding and reporting on where cases are coming from so that individuals can make intelligent, smart decisions around how to keep themselves and their families safe 
I think taking a really critical look at what we're doing around dining, giving the increasing reports from the CDC and other agencies around the risks associated with indoor dining. And I think really engaging with what our plan is going to be uh, as we move into the colder uh, period of time in Boston and we start to lose many of those outdoor options that we've utilized for social gatherings, physical activity, dining, et cetera, in the coming months. Can you elaborate a little bit on the reporting that you would like to see increased or enhanced? I know I remember covering the press conference when the governor rolled out that new color-coded map that we've been talking about, that we talked about at the beginning of this show. That provides community-level data. What would you like to see being furnished to the public that we don't have access to right now? Well, I would really like to know a couple of things. First is what percent of cases are we able to trace back to their origin to determine where these individuals got infected? That's a really key measure of how well the public health system is performing, especially for a disease like COVID that is often very reliant on super spreading events. So can we identify where the super spreading events are happening? And then I think for the second reason, providing information to the public so that they know what is safer and perhaps what is less safe, information to businesses so that they can plan and information to lawmakers so that they can structure relief measures around the sectors that are dealing with uh, the largest burden from an economic perspective. Sandy, Sam outlined some things he'd like to see proceed a little bit differently uh, than they currently are. Do you agree with his proposals or might you have other things, uh, areas where you would suggest we sharpen up or change our approach a bit? Sure. And I think that um, I think that some of this information is evolving. But, you know, one of the things that we really haven't done in the reporting is separate out symptomatic cases or symptomatic testing from asymptomatic testing. And with a real ramp up of asymptomatic testing, it makes it really difficult for us to know why we are seeing some of these numbers going up. And that will make it a lot harder for us if we don't know to figure out how best to trace and to contain so that these, the, these, these individuals who are infected aren't spreading. I think also just having a little bit more nuance as what was mentioned, you know, understanding are, where are these cases? Are they clusters? Are they, um, are we able to identify groupings that, that we could give us a little bit of reassuring for reassurance, for example? Um, there are some towns that have very high rates, but it may be because of cases in a long-term care facility or cases in a prison, and it may not actually reflect the real risk in the community. So understanding some of that nuance to those numbers would be really helpful. Sandy, I'm going to stick with you for a second. I'd love to get your take as someone who helped craft the school reopening plan that the state came up with. How do you feel the reopening of schools is proceeding so far? Are things going the way you had hoped they would? You know, I think, to be honest, I had really hoped we would see a little bit more in terms of in-person learning. Um, you know, certainly when these plans were being were, were evolving, uh, the rates were really quite low. Um, I think the challenge is the difference between the plans and the implementation. And in fairness, you know, these are hard to implement, putting in distancing strategies and ensuring that there are masks and, and you know, places for kids to play and for 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 eating lunch and things like that, that's hard to do. So there is a little disappointment in my um, on my end in terms of how many people have gotten back to in-person learning, especially when we consider the balance um, and the harms with not being in school for, for certain people. I think that um, from the standpoint of transmission, I feel like that's been such, that's been a success thus far. There haven't been a lot of cases reported uh, in the schools. And, and to my knowledge, there hasn't been really evidence of transmission in schools. And that's what we were really hoping to, to uh, ensure. Uh, Sam, let me ask you for your take on, on the school situation. Uh, you, unlike Sandy, as far as I know, did not help the Baker administration craft their approach. Do you feel like uh, people are being overly cautious when it comes to in-person learning, not cautious enough, uh, somewhere in between? I, I think it's very complicated. The importance of in-person learning really cannot be stressed enough. And in-person learning includes many, many other things that are critical elements for our community and for our children, aside from just what happens directly in the classroom with the teachers. So I, I think we've been advocating in our group and, and many other individuals for as much work as possible to be put into safely reopening our in-person education. As you mentioned earlier, one of the big challenges is that risks like uh, aerosol transmission the news and information coming from groups like the CDC keeps shifting in time and it makes it very difficult for uh, administrators, political leaders to understand what really is safe and what really is 
going to be risky. And so I think we're dealing with a very complicated situation because of that vacuum uh, in, in information. I don't envy anyone having to, to come up with plans based on guidance from official sources that continue shifting what they're telling us to do. Let me ask you both in closing. We've got um, just over a minute left, so please keep your replies brief. But there's so much bad info out there from a number of high-profile sources about how to manage COVID. What advice would you give to people as we head into the winter? And again, maybe 20 or 30 seconds each would be terrific. You know, I'll go ahead and start. I think that, you know, we, we really do. There is a core of fundamental information that we do know, and we do know what we need to do to protect ourselves, masking, social distancing, avoiding large crowds, avoiding congregate gatherings. And if we can continue that energy, uh, I think that we will be able to get through the winter if we just don't let our guard down. Sandy, thank you. Sam, you got the last word. I think we're going to learn quite a bit, especially as we move into influenza season, as we learn more about what's going to happen as we move inside. And so it's going to be important that individuals pay close attention uh, as recommendations may shift as we move into the winter. And I think to understand that a vaccine is coming, it's not going to be uh, a magic solution, but it is going to be a really important resource that will help us get back to a new normal And so we need to be prepared for that uh, with a plan coming down from the federal government. All right. Sam Scarpino, Sandy Nelson, thank you both for talking this through. Thank you. Thank you.